So the, uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight uh, is uh, the rotator cuff. And really, I'm, I'm mostly talking about uh, arthroscopy and how it's changed orthopedics and, and what we've done. And I'm sort of going to use the rotator cuff and shoulder surgery as the vehicle to talk about this. Um, so uh, the real question that I think is still unanswered for all of us is, are we really getting more for less with arthroscopy or with minimally invasive surgeries? Um, and the title of the talk, America's Cup to the Rotator Cuff, uh, I, I think I can pull this together before we're finished uh, with the end of the evening. So um, this kind of stems from questions that get asked to me frequently by patients that I see in the office. And, and these things uh, are, are fairly reasonable questions and, and questions I think that, that intelligent people ask. And, and some people think they know the answers and other people know they know the answers. And, and, and very few people actually really do know the answers. And, and these things are what is the rotator cuff and, and how does it function? Or if your rotator cuff is torn, do you actually need to get it repaired or fixed? Will I heal faster if I have surgery uh, through the arthroscopy, you know, through arthroscopy or for the rotator cuff? And are my incisions always going to be smaller? Are, is my problem or are problems that are big appropriate to be treated uh, through the arthroscope? And are the results of arthroscopic treatment for, for procedures as good as the good old standards? Well, what is the rotator cuff? I mean, this is a, an essential thing. And, and in some ways, the name is misleading. The, the most simplest way to think about it is it's just a series of four muscles. They're called the supraspinatus, the subscapularis, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. They surround the shoulder joint uh, beneath all the, the bigger muscles that we see around the shoulder that show up topographically on your shoulder. So when you're looking at a person's shoulder, you're actually not looking at the rotator cuff muscles. You're looking at the deltoid, the pectoralis, the latissimus, the large kind of muscle building muscles that we think about as being around the shoulder. In, in evolution, if you believe in evolution or in creation, if you're in that camp, we've really traded uh, stability in the shoulder for mobility. And that's why the shoulder is the most frequently dislocated joint in the body. It, it, it's the joint that has the most range of motion of any other joint in the body. But the trade-off for that is that it's not a very stable joint. The function of the rotator cuff uh, is to actually try and keep the head uh, centered in the glenoid of the, the cuff, the, the head being the, the top of the humerus where the, the, uh, the top of the arm bone is, the glenoid being the name for the socket that is what, uh, on the shoulder blade. All of the sports and activities that we do, and particularly overhead sports, have one thing in common, which is that the large muscles, like the deltoid muscle you see here, and the pectoralis muscle that comes across the front of the joint, and the latissimus across the back of the joint, have the common uh, uh, functional uh, problem, if you will, that they tend to want to displace this head, this round head, up and down, forward and backwards, or inferiorly in the socket of the joint. The function of the rotator cuff is that it's a series of muscles that, that the sole function really is to keep the ball part of uh, that's attached to the head centered on this socket while the bigger muscles act to move the arm through space. And that's essentially it. They're called the rotator cuff muscles because they do assist in rotation, that is, movements to the side back and forth of the arm. But for the most part, what they really do and where problems arise is when the ball is not being centered in the socket, essentially. The rotator cuff fails in many different ways. And, and things that cause rotator cuff tears uh, can be many different things, from a simple trauma or, or one event like a car accident to attritional injuries or injuries of overuse that just occur by micro trauma or, or multiple events that hurt it. The, there are sort of two theories about how this occurs, and it's sort of a chicken or the egg thing. One theory is the theory of attrition, that people get undersurface tears in the cuff because of impingement or, or because they, they're working hard and some of the fibers begin to fail. What then happens as fibers begin to fail is that the remaining fibers have to do the work of the cuff, and those fibers are under greater stress, and then those fail. And eventually you propagate into a cuff, or into, a, excuse me, a cuff tear. The second way to think about it is uh, an impingement type of uh, pathology. With impingement, the idea is that the cuff, for some reason, is not functioning correctly, and the head is moving up and down and forward and backward in the joint. And as it does this, it's rubbing on the bony roof or the acromion uh, over the shoulder. And that rubbing or that friction, that actual physical 
uh, uh, friction is causing a breakdown of the cuff uh, musculature. And again, uh, the same process can occur. In reality, uh, the cuff tears are probably caused as a, a compromise or as a combination of, of these two different types of uh, forces and, and things. So it's actually true that an effectively functioning rotator cuff is essential to normal painless shoulder function. You need to have cuff function that, that uh, is, is working and keeping that ball centered. And if not, generally people have shoulder pain. But repairing a torn rotator cuff is a totally different thing. We've got multiple studies now which have looked at people who don't have any shoulder pain and have normal shoulder function, but gotten MRIs or ultrasounds or studies on them and found that they have cuff tears. Some people even have rather large cuff tears, but perfectly normal shoulder function. Interestingly, uh, Ken Yamaguchi uh, in St. Louis did a study where he looked at people who had a cuff tear on one side of the body and just for kicks got an ultrasound on the other side to see if they had a cuff tear over there. And many of them did. He followed these cuffs and found that about 51% of these patients would become symptomatic on the side that they, they had previously no symptoms on after an average of 2.8 years. But you have to remember this is a biased population because just by virtue of the fact that they've had one symptomatic cuff tear, they may be at an increased risk for having a second cuff tear. So actually, having a rotator cuff tear does not mean that you need to have surgery. And I think that's, it's wrong for people to tell patients that, that you, you've got a cuff tear and we've got to fix it or you're going to get arthritis that's going to take you down the wrong road. There's a, there's a population of patients where that's true, but in general, if you have a painless shoulder and good function, who cares if you have a cuff tear? That's something to get excited about. And you've all sat through some of the, the anatomy here and things like that, so we're going to talk about something different here that I get excited about, which is sailing. I don't know if anyone else here is a sailor or if anybody can name the boat that you see on the right side of the screen or uh, that the poem on the left is written about. The clue is that it's 1850. The other clue is that there's a large, shiny object that's named after this boat. It is, in fact, the America. The, the America actually started as a boat, and I promise you I'll try and get this back to rotator cuff surgery, but it started uh, as, as sort of part of a wager to the New York Yacht Club. The English Yacht Club, uh, uh, the Royal uh, Yacht Squadron, actually, in England, had um, been wagering on a lot of high-priced uh, uh, races. Back in the 1800s, and, and maybe now still, um, there was a lot of betting that surrounded yacht racing. Well, they came up with what they thought was a reasonably good challenge, which is that they had a huge money pot uh, and bragging rights for any boat that could come and win a race around the Isle of Wight. The second thing is that the, the 74 mile uh, tour around the Isle of Wight is in some of the most riptide, hazardous, rocky waters uh, with strange currents and things like that. And the race hugely favored the British ships that were competing. Well, the New York Yacht Club commissioned a boat to be built by a boat builder named Stevens. And he built a boat that was 101 feet long, really huge actually, even by that day's standards, 23 feet wide. It drew 11 feet of water. It had 5,263 square feet of sail, which was just an enormous amount by the day's standards compared to the size of the boat. And it cost them, in the end, $20,000 to have it built. In fact, the boat cost about $30,000 to be designed and built. But part of their commission to Stevens was that the boat had to beat any boat in America before it went over. And there was one boat named the Maria that was actually able to, to beat uh, the America before it left, although it wasn't seaworthy enough to get over to England. So they bargained with Stevens. They got the boat for $20,000 on a steal, and they took it over to race. Well, what happened, it was really, uh, this boat was sort of a triumph of technology. And for better or for worse, a lot of the design ideas came from sort of unscrupulous things um, that, that had to do with the slaving ships at the time. So this, this boat had a flat stern, a sharp hollow bow that actually cut water instead of just pushing it out of the way, high mast rake, which made the sails efficient, and they used cotton rather than flax in the sails. A lot of triumph, a lot of things that were, were really changed and somewhat radical in the industry back in the, at the time. Well, they went to cows and they destroyed the competition. It, it, and it was a sound victory for, for the American uh, uh, Yacht Club there. They actually renamed the cup, the America's Cup, and it stayed that. It was one of the, uh, uh, perhaps the, the longest running uh, legacy of a, of a single one sports event. I think the America held the cup into the 1980s when Dennis Con Connor lost it. 
Well, what does this boat have to do with the arthroscope? Well, really, the boat has nothing to do with the arthroscope, but, but this boat may, by the end of the talk, uh, have something to do with arthroscopy. This boat is a model of the America. It's three and three quarters inches long. It's a half inch wide. It draws about one millimeter of glue. It has three square inches of sail, and I, I, I built it uh, for about $9.95 out of balsa wood, toothpicks, pins, and thread when I was setting this talk up. Now this is a triumph of technology over reason, building this, this ship. Uh, it, it has no real purpose. It's a copy of all the design ideas that went along with the America, uh, and it fits in a bottle. But besides that, there's really nothing to this boat that's uh, spectacular. Well, you can think about arthroscopy in some ways and wonder if arthroscopy is, in fact, itself a triumph of technology over reason. Uh, arthroscopy sort of started in 1931. Uh, a man named Berman uh, started to perform uh, very small camera studies in cadavers. And uh, after this, uh, not until 1950, did an actual arthroscope that could be used in, in human beings was it developed. It was developed by a Japanese surgeon named Watanabe. He developed a, a scope that he called the number 21, and it was really the, the mainstay for arthroscopic treatment uh, up until the 1970s. Well, up until then, treatment was really examination. There were very few indications for the arthroscope. Uh, you could take a look around the shoulder joint, something we call diagnostic arthroscopy, and just sort of see the lay of the land. You could occasionally find and remove a, a loose fragment of bone or a piece of cartilage that was stuck in the joint. Um, and they started working on developing different portals or different regions of the shoulder that were safe to get into with instruments. But by and large, there was very little that you could do with the arthroscope. By the mid-80s, the indications for arthroscopy were starting to grow a little bit. Uh, people were treating shoulder dislocations with it. People were treating impingement syndrome or that rubbing of, uh, against the bony roof above the shoulder with it. Uh, people were trying to treat rotator cuff tears with it. But the results initially were pretty discouraging compared to the traditional techniques at the time, which had developed into mini open techniques. Well, what are mini open techniques? The idea behind a mini open surgery is that rather than have a large surgery, a large incision and take down the muscles to get to the shoulder, that you'd create a small window or portal uh, just at the outside edge of the shoulder joint and through that portal you'd work on the rotator cuff. Now they got the, the, the ideas behind this down pretty sound to where people were actually able to fix cuffs reasonably well. I liken it to working it through the mouth of a bottle. It's a little difficult to get to where you need to get, but you can get there generally. If you need to work on the stem of the boat, if you need to work at the end that's close to the bottle, it's a pretty simple thing to do. The problem is that rotator cuffs tend to atrophy, and the tears as they progress tend to start to pull away from the end of the cuff that's most accessible. So here we can see this is where when someone first tears their cuff, the way the cuff might sit. But as time develops, if they haven't had it fixed, and if it's becoming a problem, if, if, it, if they continue to do forceful things that are painful and they're continuing to work on the cuff or it just is neglected or not noticed, even if it's asymptomatic, what can happen is this cuff tear can pull back. Well, then this really does become like building a ship in a bottle. And the techniques that people did to, that do still to try and take care of this are basically to try and access this free cuff edge, to free the cuff up as much as possible from the, the muscles in the front and the muscles in the back. And the images that you're looking at are as if we're looking straight down at the rotator cuff from the top with all the other muscles around the shoulder removed. So we're basically looking down at the cuff. This is the front up here. This is the back back here. And this is the supraspinatus muscle, or the top rotator cuff muscle, if you will, coming across the top. And again, the idea is to reach in, to lasso this cuff edge, and to bring it out to where it's supposed to be out at the end of the, the bone on the humerus. Again, it's a lot like, and even after I, I built this ship for this talk, because I thought if I'm going to do this analogy, I better have at least tried to build a ship in a bottle. So I did. And I actually found that this analogy sort of holds. What happens when you build a ship in a bottle, I, I never knew this, but you actually build the ship outside the bottle, you make it so the sails can collapse, you put the ship inside the bottle, and then you actually pull up the rigging using this little string uh, or, or this foreline that you've got sitting here. So here's, here's this little America. I've built the thing entirely. I've collapsed down the sails. We can stick it in the bottle, and then I've got this string sticking out here off the end, and you can pull it up. And that's the same thing you do when you're doing a mini open cuff repair. You can reach in. You prepare the cuff edge, you tie your sutures to it, and you pull it to the edge where it needs to be and fasten it in place. So what's the problem?